Today on September 15th, uh, we are in conversation with Frank Barat and Vijay Parshad, uh, who have recently published a series of reflections that were developed together over um, a series of exchanges, a lot of them taking place in the con deep context of the pandemic. Uh, the result is a finely edited book called Struggle Makes Us Human. Um, and I would encourage people to look that up themselves and, and read the exchanges. So first of all, I'll just say hi and thank you so much to both of you for the exchange and the, the continuation of the conversation today. It's great to be with you. Nice to see the lovely trees behind you. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Stefan. And we, we both love the T-shirt, even though I guess, you know, the radio folks, I'm not going to see anything, but we'll publish the video. Oh. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll just say um, it is a, a T-shirt of Radio Hara, which is a community arts uh, broadcasting project in occupied Palestine. So anybody who's interested, I encourage people to check it out at radioalhara.net. So um, first of all, I'll just share that Struggle Makes Us Human is a really fluid project. Uh, you impressively, even within the different sections, travel to diverse spots in the globe, looking at the contradictions and the challenges of social movements, questions of power, and one of the first um, uh, points that is raised is this idea of the continuation or the critique that is voiced around the idea of a continuous line of progress in relation to social movement struggles. The point that Vijay keeps bringing up, and there's a series of examples that are highlighted, is the concept of a zigzag, um, which I loved as a, as a both as a visual terminology, but also in terms of thinking about time in a non-linear fashion if we want to get into the concepts of provincializing Europe and decoloniality. But maybe first we could start there and uh, I'll, I'll go to Vijay and then to Frank to sort of think about the non-linear concept of social movements and change, um, because I think that's not really still, unfortunately, the common framework of how social struggle is understood. Yeah, you know, Stefan, if you think about the image of, um, and I've used this image a lot in reference to Palestine, um, but if you if you think about the image of a person leaning over you as you lie in your bed, and they are holding a pillow in their hand, and they shove that pillow on your face, attempting to suffocate you, at some point, you're going to fight them. You know, no human being is going to just allow another person to suffocate them in their bed. They are going to fight them. Now, when you travel to a place like Gaza or you travel to parts of, of let's say, southern Congo, the areas where the mining takes place. Um, I was recently in the Atacama Desert in Chile. Travel to places like this, you know, people are put in wretched social conditions where life is very difficult. Life is extraordinarily bare, you know, and yet... Um, there is an incredible resilience, incredible desire to fight, to, to basically, um, you know, execute one's humanity, to prove that one is a human being in, in, in that sense. So, you know, as you fight from extremely adverse conditions, you will get defeated. That is inevitable because you're fighting against people who are incredibly more powerful than you. You know, in the case of Gaza, for instance, you're fighting against the Zionist war machine, which is incredibly powerful. And yet you return the next day and the next day and the next day because you cannot allow yourself not to exercise your humanity. You will continue to fight. You will refuse to be made inert. You know, you will refuse to be suffocated. And in that sense, I think the zigs and zags are important. If you look at the great history of anti-colonial movements, think of the defeats that people uh, you know, had to face in the midst of their long battle against colonialism. Horrendous defeats, and yet they came back and fought again. I'm frustrated with a lot of the kind of writing that takes place now where people throw their hands up in the air and say, you know, there's so many problems, there's no solution, people are not fighting. Absolutely untrue. People are fighting all over the world. It's, there's a big difference between fighting against suffocation and being able to win. 
people are fighting but they're not always winning and i think keeping that gap in line helps us understand the zigs and the zags you can take a defeat but you'll come back will you win that's a separate question Thanks so much, Vijay, for sharing your thoughts on this. I'd like to also maybe focus on two examples from that section of the book. But Frank, uh, if you could share any reflections uh, in relation to this point and also your own involvement in, in supporting uh, social movements on a local level, but also more broadly uh, trying to connect that to an international scale. So that's always a challenge is how do we draw and make connections between very local organizing on a you know neighborhood based level all the way to an international level and i think that is also one of the challenges the the radical left faces in terms of scaling and structures of power yeah thanks stefan um i mean there's this um saying right better it's better to leave uh to die sorry to die standing than leave on your knees and I think that's exactly what Vijay was talking about. And and when you go to Palestine, or when you 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 speak to local communities in in I live in Brussels, in Brussels, uh, you know, marginalized, um, racialized, um, that face like police brutality every day, um, you realize that you have a choice, and the choice is you either fat you are, you know you either fight or you. Or you, or you just don't fight and you leave on, on your knees. And I think most, most people. But I mean, it's it's very interesting in a way when you you, you put this in in regards to white folks. You know, I'm white uh, because like, even though I guess I some of some of us are very deeply involved involved with the movement, it's very hard for us to completely relate to you know minorities racialized mar marginalized because we're not and um and once we try to do it we realize that actually they don't have a choice and fighting is is the only way you know the only life they can lead until you know hopefully oppression falls and uh, but like a, a quick anecdote about this a friend of mine is called um, i'll say his name he's called Nail Khleifi. He's actually the son of Michel Khleifi, the very well-known um, sort of the pioneer of Palestinian cinema. And Nael recently told me that, so Nael is born in Belgium, he's entirely Belgium. He actually, he could look Arabic, but he, I mean, his mother in Belgium, so he, 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 he looks very Belgian. He's, he's, and um, he told me that until you live it and you experience it, you, you can't put yourself in the shoes of, you know, if you're a man of a woman, of a woman of color, or of a Muslim. And he said that between 18 and 19, he had this like period where he thought, I'm a Muslim. You know, he wasn't like his dad is actually a, a Christian Palestinian, but he was like, no, I'm a Muslim. So he said, like, uh, you know, in the space of a couple of weeks, he's changed his appearance. You know, he started wearing the sort of Muslim, you know, hat, hat and he grow his beard. And he said, Frank, you can't, you can't understand how my life changed in six months. The way people looked at me, the way we I was going to a shop, you know, the shopkeeper would like bend over to see if like I didn't steal anything. The way people sometimes change, you know, you know, on the pavement, they crossed the street when they saw me. It, it was like he told me an incredible experience, incredible and, and very telling. So I think, you know, we, we have to to understand that for, for people like uh, like Palestinians and others, it, they don't have a choice and they will fight and um and and in a way like the, the example of palestine is the best one because like even though the the zionist movement has tried to expel them uh, via you know incredible force in in 47 48 and now like it's a slow sort of drip ethnic cleansing they're still there so i think that's the, the biggest victory I would just maybe follow up with something that draws on both of your reflections, um, which is also what was mentioned, the question of scaling and the relationship between the, the violence of the colonial capitalist system today and how it manifests at an individualized level, but also how it operates on a systemic level. 
if we look to the global justice movement and the critiques of you know international finance institutions like the world bank the international monetary fund the world trade organization which is still functioning and i think not as much in the headlines there was a very meaningful critique of the systemic violence of these structures and how that translated uh, across the world um, from uh, the ways that it pushed uh, small farmers uh, off their land through the imposition of corporate agriculture and monocropping and GMO uh, products as driven by US corporations, for example. But this um, larger systemic critique also, of course, uh, translates to daily experience rooted in colonialist violence and and histories of violence um, and how that manifests in the ways Frank was talking about on an individual level. Um, but Vijay, you were talking about also the, the challenges of social movements on a broader scale. At this moment in 2022, we're at a very interesting crossroads, it seems. And I, your book really, I think, opens up a window and your conversations, Frank and Vijay, to look at this challenge we face, which is the connection point between this mainstreaming of the ways that these systems of violence manifest on a personal level, but ensuring that that personal level is connected to a broader systemic critique. So I would I would love to hear your reflections on, on sort of this moment of challenge and, and how to deal with the nuance there, because it's very, very challenging, um, which I'm sure you both understand very well. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, everybody knows the problems. I mean, that's one of the strange things about the world, isn't it? That the diagnoses of the problems are even shared by quite mainstream people. You pick up a UN, United Nations report, and it's pretty clear, you know, these are the problems. I, I just read the recent Human Development Report, and they said for the first time in 32 years, there's been a decline for two years, consecutive years, of all human indicators. 90% of the world's countries have seen a decline in human indicators. You know, this includes increase of hunger and so on. The cost of living crisis is, is going to escalate some of these. Pro Everybody knows what the problem is. Everybody also knows that the very small minority of rich people uh, have all the power, privilege, and you know, property that uh, they don't deserve. I mean, you know, tens of trillions of dollars held by just a few people. It's not, they, there's no need for analysis, you know. We don't need another hundred books about this. We need to figure out why is it that six, seven billion people, more, six, seven point eight, nine, five billion people are not able to overcome 20 people that dominate the world. I mean, what's the problem? Like demographically, we are, we are the overwhelming majority, not 99%, 99.999 to the n percent. What's the problem? The problem is we can't build power. Um, and here comes ideology, plays a big role. Uh, mystifications of all kinds, the belief that if I try hard enough, I can do well. And despite the fact that generation upon generation have not been able to succeed, we continue to have this myth of individual success, you know, push down our throats. There's also the worry for oneself and one's family, forms of nepotism, forms of personal desire. Like I know the planet is going to hell, but at least my children must advance. You know, they must do well. All these mystifications interrupt our lives. And what this does at the same time it decreases our confidence in our own capacity to change the world. And I think for me, the idea of confidence is key. Um, you know, I, I was watching in the UK, these big strikes of transport workers, the RMT, uh, cascading strikes, you know, nurses and others going on strike. Well, every time you see a strike and when you see a movement leader like Mick Lynch speak so clearly in, you know, mainstream television, it gives a person in their home confidence that, you know, if Mick Lynch, who speaks like me, can go on to television, BBC, and talk back to some of these Cambridge educated, you know, neoliberal thinkers, well, maybe I should get onto the street. Cascading sense of confidence. We saw this in the farmer's struggle. And let me give you this as a brief example. Between 1995, when Indian agriculture liberalized, 
and maybe the mid 2000s the first decade of the 2000s almost 300000 indian farmers committed suicide it's like the largest mass suicide in the world they were committing suicide exactly for the reasons you mentioned stefan that you know they were losing their land they were not able to make a living and so on can you imagine that there was this mass suicide and it was barely mentioned in the mainstream newspapers well farmers in maharashtra a state in india started a protest they did a long march from nasik to mumbai it caught the imagination the all india kisan sabha the main farmers association main farmers body then took the lessons of maharashtra and ran a major struggle in rajasthan again they did a long march they went you know with motorcycles and it was a fantabulous kind of event um, eventually when the modi government tried to shove down the farmers throats laws that would uberize farming make them essentially like uber drivers they just said no and then hundreds of thousands of farmers rather than commit suicide went and surrounded the city of delhi and made the government back down it's really important that people all over the world look at these stories you got a choice between either committing actual suicide or kind of social suicide or you struggle and if you struggle you can win you know many years ago when i was a kid i read a line from lenin and, and i'm going to put this in there I, i know it might make some people uncomfortable but there was a line from lenin lenin said if you're too afraid to lose you won't do anything if you're too afraid to lose you won't do anything and that's about confidence you know you got to have the confidence because remember he said if you're too afraid to lose that means you don't have confidence you got to generate confidence confidence doesn't come by me and you telling people have confidence confidence comes by learning about what other people are doing that they are going out in struggle transport workers in the uk farmers in india landless workers in brazil those stories become infectious and that's what i feel i feel like we know what the problems are we need to do something and what's holding us back is the mystifications of ideas and ideology and so on and also a lack of confidence in the examples you highlighted vj there's a connection between also that individual experience of social movement uh struggles and mobilization and collective action so just drawing a bit more on that connection point frank if you have any, any thoughts on that because i also know that you have experience in 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 relation to, to to visiting that space between individual participation and larger questions of collective organization yeah and i think you know to to sort of follow on on vijay's point um even if the numbers don't compare you know the rate of suicide right now inside the nhs for example in the uk doctors nurses or inside the, of the education system teachers that are is incredible i mean and and it says a lot again it doesn't compare to the indian farmers but the rates are up and i think because we we going through a system pe- people always, always say i mean the system is broken for me it's not the system fulfill its pur- its purpose entirely you know the capitalist system is about as we just said you know stomping on people uh you know 99.9 of the population and and making the other so again it's not about reform it's not it's it's about thinking of completely dismantling and abolishing the system to create something better but i also understand that for most people it's it's a it's a mountain you know it's too high to climb so we have to work with the macro and the you know the macro and the local um to to build these to build power and we start you know like with a small sort of council and then you you go up and up but it's um the ideology in place and 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 the the way consent has been manufactured to quote Herman and Chomsky is so powerful and and you see it every day i mean to to people you talk to in the street at work you know on zooms um this you know tina there is no alternative is still very much in people's head you know people don't think we can do it 
you know, and that's also what Vijay talks about, you know, the question of confidence. And you, you, you speak a lot about this in, in the book, Vijay, and you say that you, you mentioned the first time you went to a demonstration, I think in India, and, and the way it builds confidence so much because in a way we, we are taught every day if you watch mainstream media corporate media that we're alone you know we we powerless you know get your thousand euros a month buy whatever you can with it and that's it you know but once you get to a huge demonstration or once you 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 become involved in, in praxis in a way it changes everything it does I, i'm sure he did for you stefan he did it for me it, my first demonstration was in france against the national front i'd never been to a demo and i've never felt so en energized you know uh, af after this and um, and i was scared it was scary because the, the 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 riot police was definitely on the side of the national front so we had to run and tear gas but we, you never felt that empowered and and you feel the people you met in the streets sometimes in in a couple of days could become brothers and sisters for life you know stuff you'd never experienced before so i, th I think that's something and that's why in a way demonstrations are important some people will say you know we were three million in the streets against the iraq war but nothing happened even though we know it's not the truth but the fact being in the street itself is crucial because it creates so much momentum and power and and, and strength so um and that's what you experience all the time to, to sort of answer your question briefly like i remember when i went to palestine as well the first time they told us you know we see you when we in, in gaza or in nablus and we see that there was like one million people in london against the uh, aggression uh, the war of israel it gives us so much power as well so demonstration have a massive role to play and um and uh, yeah that's pretty much it I'll tell you a little story I just experienced, guys. I, I was in Ireland um, recently and I visited Shannon. And on a Sunday at 2 p.m., about 20 minutes, no, sorry, 20 feet walk from the perimeter of Shannon Airport, I met about 10 activists who belong to Shannon Watch. They are there once a month at 2 p.m. on the second Sunday. Among them was Marguerite Dar Darcy, who's a important... Irish filmmaker, Frank will know her. She's a, a playwright. She was an extraordinary reference at the Greenham Women's Common in the 1980s and so on. There was Marguerite, age 88 years old. Um, just a few years ago, she and Niall Farrell ran onto the runway to block uh, an aircraft, which was most likely carrying somebody who was undergoing extraordinary rendition, the illegal program of the US government. Now, it's because of people like Marguerite Darcy uh, and, and others that um, pressure has been put on the Irish government for its collaboration with the um, US war machine. And in a sense, it's because of them that we learned about the extraordinary rendition program. You know, yes, it's true. We all want to be once in a while in demonstrations with millions of people and those count. But demonstrations of small numbers of people also count. And the first demonstration, what Frank said is correct. The first time you go out for them, it's hugely inspiring, terrifying, and all that. By the way, for me, going out to my million demonstration, I'm still terrified. Age of 55, haven't been to demonstrations since my teens. I'm still scared when I have to go. I still think, will there be anybody there? What am I doing? Am I too old for this? All these things go through my head. You know, this is a kind of confidence that you have to, in a way, build every time. You know, every day when you wake up, I, I, I'm no great sympathizer for, um, you know, self-affirmative kind of rituals, you know, like I am okay, I'm alive and so on. But there's nothing wrong with that to affirm yourself on a regular basis, you know, people of the left sometimes forget uh, that they are people who must also affirm on a regular basis, first principles. What happens, guys, is you become desolate and you also become arrogant, like, oh, I know things and I know how the world works and other people don't know. And so on. a kind of arrogance enters into our traditions, but also a kind of desolation. You know, I've been doing this over and over again. And you sort of have an EO attitude to it. You know, the sky is going to fall on my head and I'm going, but nobody cares. And 
this is a very wrong attitude we need to be enthusiastic every time we go out we need to feel a little of the fear a little bit of the lack of confidence uh, we need to f- allow ourselves to feel human and and i think sometimes in the left a kind of you know a skin a hard hippopotamus skin develops where people become super like insensate they don't feel things and it's really important to encourage feeling because that's how you make bridges with other people you know not that oh i i'm an expert at demonstrations welcome to your first de- there's no need to be arrogant about it every demonstration in a way is like a first demonstration there is a sense of of fear every piece of our struggle is a renewal of our capacity to be human so i i'm very much in favor of a kind of recurrence of that feeling not just the first time but always Yeah I mean if I want if I can add something uh, because it made me think of I think Arundhati Roy was the sort of the first time I heard this but you know this uh, to love and to be loved that we often forget also on on the sort of hard left you know we get a but love is is at the core of everything right and I think when Vijay says like we we've got to allow, allow ourselves to be human and stuff is also to show love you know and show support and have this you know this self care that we all all you know forget so often as as uh, as activists because you know you you see so many friends and comrades that burn out because they you know you you can't, you cannot help anyone if you are yourself you know uh, very low in 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 everything right so i think that's that's crucial the book uh, that you both worked on struggle makes us human i think really in meaningful ways connects these personal experiences and personal reflections to points across the globe i'd really encourage people to check it out um and to read these conversations and both of you in 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 many ways over the years i think uh have shown also um ways to break isolation through your work uh in publishing books radio um social media even but to think about also how we can have these conversations but also how ha- have these conversations in difference right so i i think it's also important to underline the fact that social movements have debates about tactics about strategy about questions of power and it's through those conversations that we can continue to uh move in these struggles and and to and to actually learn from our histories um and there's so much there and this book i think is very challenging in the sense that i, I can't think of a of a social movement internationally that is not addressed within these wide ranging conversations which is always impressive and we've run out of time so thanks for the conversation and um uh vj frank uh, good to talk with you Thanks. It's lovely uh, to be with you. Thanks. Yeah, thanks Stefan. And I think if I if I can add something, I, I think these books of of conversations in a way that are quite small as well and and I I think easy to read uh, can be very useful because like it's all about conversations, right? Mm-hmm. You know, if if you want to tell your parents what's happening in the world, you're going to have a conversation with them. If you want to uh, you know if your friends doesn't don't agree with you it's a conversation so i think these conversations are, can be very very useful uh because it's it, it can be also less heavy than very academic books and and uh, and stuff like that but anyway respect uh, respect thanks thanks a bunch comrades thanks